Good morning and welcome to Thursday of Strategic Farm Week of our Winter 2020 series. Uh, great to have you joining us and um, welcome to those that this is their first session of the week and welcome back to those that might have joined us for a couple of others before. Uh, you're in for a treat this morning um, as we get into the detail of um, flowering strips and how we can boost beneficials and control our pests um, across the landscape and think about the habitat for supporting both of those. Uh, my name is Theresa Meadows and I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager for HDB um, covering East Anglia and it's my privilege to host um, today's session alongside my fellow speakers here today, uh, Brian, Rob, Hannah and Mark, who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, today's session I think is something that is really important for us, has been for many years, but suddenly has a massive a massive uptake and a massive increase of importance um, going forward with changes to chemistry with an um, move towards more of an environmental um, measures going forward enhancing biodiversity and farming possibly, possibly in a slightly different way going forwards. AHDB um, is seeing this um, as an important part of our strategy going forwards and I have a personal interest as well um, as I've started a Nuffield scholarship looking at how we can increase the uptake of IPM integrated pest management across the landscape so we've got lots to talk about today and possibly bring in some international flavour um, to the conversation as well and uh, lots to learn from what's been going on in our strategic farms. So if we just um, move on to our housekeeping, um, you're all on mute. We can't see you and can't hear you, unfortunately, um, but you can definitely chat with us. Um, there's a questions box on your um, tab on GoToWebinar along the side. If you pop questions in there, um, I can see them and Christian who sat behind the scenes um, looking after us all can see them as well, but nobody else can. Um, so feel free to put anything in there. If you're struggling with any of the audio or visual, um, let us know equally. If you've got questions as we go through, pop them in there and then I'll post them to the speakers. We're planning to be here today until half past 10 um, and we've got plenty of time uh, for that reason for questions and discussion both at the end and as we go through um, the slides so feel free to pop them in um, any questions that you have and we'll take them as we go. This session is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channels at the end of the week plus you'll get an email um, with, to be able to watch a recording back so you don't need to take notes necessarily um, and you can also pass it on to a friend if you find it interesting and think you could share it as well. Um, if you want to stay in touch with things going on, um, our, if you're on Twitter at AHDB Serials is doing a lot of tweeting this week um, plus our speakers here and I'll share their hand, Twitter handles at the end of the week. Equally, um, today's um, seminar session is part of a wider series of events going on to share the work happening on our HDB strategic cereal farms during the week. And all of that information is available on the website at the link below. Um, we've got a series of harvest reports um, that are available um, through that link looking and detailing the results, the costings, the analysis um, from the east and the west farms and introducing the baselining that's happening at the Strategic Farm Scotland. We've got a series of videos that Brian and Rob have done along with our ADAS researchers and David Aglin up in Scotland um, that kind of give you a flavour in a different way and they're all available on YouTube and then the webinar sessions from the week um, and a quiz coming up tomorrow as well. I'm um, delighted to tell you we've been awarded two bases and two Neroso, um, a win for the week. I think the highest grossing Neroso um, point scorer for the week. So you're on the right um, session if you're a Neroso um, person. So if you'd like to claim your basis and Neroso points, if you pop um, your, well, your name, your account number, postcode um, and your date of birth, if you'd like Neroso into the questions box, Christian and I will make sure that that's recorded and registered for you. And if you're watching this back, um, if you email Teresa Meadows, so teresa.meadows at ahdb.org.uk, I'll make sure those are claimed for you as well. The other thing that we've added um, for you oh, today, um, so the, the plan for today is uh, to run through um, a series of kind of presentations. So Rob is going to introduce um, on behalf of Rob and Brian what's been going on at the East and the West Farms um, in terms of the establishment of the flowering strips 
and um, how we're monitoring the aphids and actual enemies and how that's come about. And we're then going to hand over to Mark Ramsden. Mark's um, an ADAS crop scientist and Mark and the team have been working with us to do the assessments at the east and the west uh, over the last um, year. And Mark, along with Lorna Cole up in Scotland and Aoife Rajuska and I are taking that work forward with us. So Mark's got a fascinating insights to share from what's been learned already and how we can use that on farm um, for you all within your own businesses and what we're looking at going forwards. And then really pleased to welcome with us today Hannah McGrath. Hannah is a PhD researcher at Rothamsted Research and I came across Hannah um, for her passion and enthusiasm for looking at this same topic but in carrot crops. Um, and we thought it would just be quite an interesting um, insight into what's going on in there and the high value and the things that Hannah's learning, um, which is um, very relevant across um, both of our sectors. Hannah's just um, got to be congratulated for being the silver medalist for the British Agricultural Student of the Year as well, Hannah. So well done for that. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing what you found out about as well. And then we're going to have a panel discussion and um, with our speakers um, and asking questions from you, the audience, at the end of um, the session. And then, so next, um, Christian, please. Um, so the thing that um, we have added on um, as the handouts tab on the side of your screen as well, um, in the Strategic Farm West report, if you click on that um, and scroll to page 12, um, on page 12 onwards um, is a lot of the results that Mark's going to be talking through um, and it, it might be interesting Mark possibly if, if you've got that open and, and you can talk through that and it's got the details and there. There's the same thing in the East report as well um, and that's all available via our website um, on there. Today is about kind of sharing the story and taking you on the start of that journey um, that we've started on the strategic farms um, but the strategic farms are all about putting research into practice and Brian and Rob um, have started doing that for us but it really is about you doing that on farm as well and so I've also attached a few sheets that our colleague Charlotte Rowley has put together about um, how you'd be able to put some of the things that Mark and Hannah and Brian and Rob are going to talk about today and how you can put that into practice on your own farm so that might be worth um, just downloading and having a look at um, um, at, at the end of the session as well. So I think, Christian, um, that our plan today um, really is, as I said, to share with you the results that we found um, in this first year of our work at the Strategic Farms, but really for you to start to think about pests and beneficials that you've got on the farm and how they can be managed and enhanced across your farm landscape. And hopefully by the end of the morning, um, that's what you will have um, been able to think about a bit more. Equally, if there are specific things that you've come on to this seminar session today and thought I'd really like to know about X, if you'd like to pop them in the questions box as well, and then we'll endeavour to make sure by the end of the session that we've answered that. So feel free to let us know now what you'd like to know by the end um, and ask us any more that you find out as you go through. So I think that's enough of my introduction. Um, welcome to you all. And I'm now going to hand over to Rob to give us a bit of a, an introduction as to how this has come about on our strategic farms. Thanks, Teresa, and uh, morning, everybody. And um, yeah, welcome to um, uh, the uh, last webinar this week for the Strategic Farm. Uh, more stuff going on tomorrow as well, but um, yeah, this is at least the last time you'll uh, you'll you'll hear from me and the others this week. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick, uh, brief introduction um, to this trial from a farmer point of view, from my point of view, um, uh, how we've laid it out, how it's working. Uh, before you hear a lot more uh, detail from, from um, Mark and Hannah. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Christian. So this, um, this trial came about mm. off the back of something called the ASSIST project run by the CEH, um, looking at encouraging beneficials um, both at the edge and within um, our, our fields, within the crops themselves, um, with the end game of getting the beneficials up to a certain level where we don't have to worry about applying insecticides. And that's the, that's the end game for me to reduce um, insecticide uh, use on, on, on our farm or, you know, hopefully um, uh, completely get rid of it. 
So um, the trial split into into three areas, um, sort of three fields. So um, there on your screen, you're looking at the um, how we how they're laid out on both the, the the strategic farm west, which is us on the left there, and the strategic farm east um, for Brian Barker over um, over in the east. Um, one one area looking at a sort of um, doing nothing different, so a field. Uh, being monitored, which has no margins, none of these flowering strips in it at all, to try and get an idea of of um, of, of of what's the baseline. Um, so, on from my point of view, um, on the west, um, on the left-hand side of that slide, so uh, down the bottom of the picture there, an area um, an area of the field there containing no margins, um, either around the edge or in the middle of the crop. Then we look at uh, the benefits of just having these margins up the side of the fields. So at the upper edge um, of that image, you can see where we've got a, a, we've got a long rectangular field uh, with margins just down the side. Um, and then the third part of it is to put margins in field. Um, so we have a margin at either end of the field and then nothing at the sides, um, but then margins um, in the crop in the field. Now the idea there is they are roughly 100 meters apart. Um, the the theory being, and I'm sure Mark will will explain more on this. The theory being that the beneficials will move out into the field around 50 meters um, either side of the margin. And therefore, if you have a margin every 100 meters, you're sort of at the optimal spacing um, to allow them to encroach um, into the crop. Um, in terms of um, layout and practical uh, layout um, of the infield strips. Um, I think that's what puts most farmers off um, going down this route or investigating this uh, this sort of thing. Um, obviously you've got we've got six meter uh, margins running up the middle of the field running up the middle of your crop uh, which can cause a headache to um, how we apply fertilizer and sprays. Um, Personally, I think nowadays with um, a lot of GPS technology available, um, it's actually far easier to lay these things out now. Um, there are six meter strip um, within uh, um, our spray boom. So we just flick off the sections. Actually, through modern GPS and mapping, we've actually got them mapped as no spray zones. So just in case myself or my uh, my sprayer operator forget to switch those sections off, um, it'll allow for minimal overlap on those on those plots because there are no spray areas. The sprayer knows it. As soon as the boom goes over those um, goes over those areas, it, it will automatically switch off those sections. So the risk of accidentally um, applying herbicides um, onto these strips is is hugely reduced. They're obviously in the same line as the tram lines, um, so you don't have to worry about going across them. Um, we we took the view, um, it's probably worth saying these trials as well as, the, as at the strategic farms, they're also going on on a few of the monitor farms as well. Um, and we're, we're probably all doing it a little bit uh, differently. There was... Um, Initially, the plan was to run the infield margins all the way up into the headland margins, um, but it has to work practically with what the farmer's trying to do um, on farm as well. So we've decided not to do that. So we have got 18 meters between the end of the infield um, margins and the, and, the, and, the, and the boundary margins, just so we can get the drill round. I didn't want to split particularly small fields. I didn't want to split completely into three smaller fields and have an increased headland effect. Um, so we do. Um, so we are able to cultivate and drill um, all the way around the headlands because we've got that 18 meters between the end of the infill margins and the um, um, and the headland margin. Ours were established uh, in the spring of 2019, so they've been in sort of 18 months now. Um, they generally establish very well. Um, there's a wide range of species within these mixes, um, which again Mark will come on to later on. Um, what we have noticed is slightly different species doing a lot better on certain types of soil and, and, the, and the farm in which our 
uh, which our trial is on is very varied in soil type. So um, loads of different um, uh, species doing better in, 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 in certain areas. We've also found that in, on, the, on, the, on the better ground, the grass can be a bit strong. So we are looking at applying um, herbicides to that, agrominicide to that, to try and thin the grass out a little bit and let the, let the flowering species have a bit more um, having a bit more space. I know that in the east, Brian established his um, mainly uh, this spring, so a year later. Um, so his uh, um, aren't quite well as established as ours because they haven't been in the ground as long. Um, and I think uh, there was an element of his which was also uh, established this uh, this autumn. Uh, so it's really good to see how um, how they're behaving differently on different farms, having been established a year apart. The mixes are slightly different across the two farms. Uh, we we began our journey with the assist project, so we were um, uh, we were provided with a mix um, from them at the time. Brian has sort of um, over in the east, they've sort of looked um, more at the specific soil types, microclimate over there, and what species would um, would do better over there. So um, slightly different. Um, uh, on both certainly on both of these farms if we can move on to the next slide please Christian so just a couple of images of how it actually looks uh, in the field so obviously the left image is the field uh, with the infield strips um, 100 meters apart fairly small field this I thought if we were going to try it out anywhere we might as well try it on the most difficult field we have to spray anyway so as well as the six meter strips in field. I've also got five oak trees to try and um, to try and get 30 meter boom round. Um, so you can see it does it does provide its headaches. But actually, like I say, with the GPS, with the modern technology, it's actually very very easy to manage. And on the right there, you can see um, uh, that was a photo taken this spring when the oxide daisy were out in full bloom, uh, looking fantastic. Um, like I say, the oxide daisy doing really, really well on 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 that particular field. This is the this is the rectangular field with the margins just down the sides, um, and very very heavy um, Eversham series clay, 65% clay, pretty snotty stuff. Oxide daisy seems to do really really well there, but then on the on the other ground on the infield strips, um, not so much oxide daisy, but a lot of other species, um, a lot of other species doing really well. So that's that's it from me, really. A little, a brief overview of how it works practically, how how us as the farmers are, are managing these infield margins, um, uh, and how we're um, and how we're getting around them, and how we're we're trying to make it work. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Rob. Um, and I've had you've already picked up on on one of the questions that's come in um, from Anthony, and um, who's asking about. I don't know, Brian, whether you want to come back as well, but asking about um, how it's best to include flowers um, when grass is prevailing. And I know it's something that you've looked at over the years, Brian, with your stewardship. And I know Mark will pick up on it a bit later. Um, but is there anything you want to add on that at the moment? It's nice you mentioned it. You know, have you found it a problem, Rob, with um, the need to put your graminicides and herbicides on? Um, no, we haven't. We haven't applied any graminicides, herbicides yet. But we, what we have got to do, particularly on the infield strips, that's on some, some of our better ground. Uh, you know, they used to grow potatoes on this ground years and years and years ago, um, and the grass has really got away there. And we are worried it's starting to smother out. So, um, what we're going to experiment with doing um, is so six meter strip. So I'm probably going to spray a three meter strip down the middle of each of the infield margins with a graminicide to try and thin the grass out. The theory being, if I accidentally destroy all of the grass, at least there's three meters of grass or a meter and a half either side um, with some grass in it still. So um, it'll, be, it'll be a little bit hit and miss, but um, uh, yeah, interesting to see how that works. Any comments from you to add to that, Brian? Or yeah, I think well, we, we've just established ours this year, so um, we've found that it's thistles is the, the early problems. Um, so we've been topping them on a regular basis, hitting them hard, keep topping, 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 um, and that's what we've found at the moment. Then we've done a bit of spot spraying. Um, we're spot spraying at the moment, sort of picking out the real big boar thistles that sort of got sort of taken away. But grass may be a problem. Ours was established after a herbage rye grass, grass um, crop. 
uh, it might become ryegrass heavy. Um, so it might be something we have to look at and take advice on. But there's plenty of people out there um, who sort of have that um, ability to sort of advise and to give you the, the, the things to do. But one question for Rob, for me, is how have you seen the general public's sort of response to this? Because obviously they do look fantastic, oxide daisies and all the different colour. Have you seen that people are asking questions about it? Or have you found them actually using them as extra walkways? Um, uh, probably the second more than the first. Yeah, they um, it's certainly very visible. It's on a farm where we've got, you've probably seen the pictures of our of, of the windmill that's on our farm, right on the top of the hill on that farm. So they go and stand up by the windmill, they see these beautiful ships and they do go in and, and, and have a wander through them. We have, um, we have, uh, had issues with people walking around them. They do, they do take an interest in 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 what we're doing. They ask why we're why we're putting them in field, why we're splitting the fields up. Um, but I think it's a good point, and I think there's a big message to get out there that we are doing this 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 kind of thing. Okay, at the moment only on a small scale, and only in a trial. But if it's something that we roll out over over a bigger area, then it's definitely a good message to get out there. Yeah. Yeah, I think some AHDB sponsored signs saying what they're doing is going to be um, requested for the strategic farm in the east. That's yeah, there's idea. some brilliant ones, aren't there? Leaf, Leaf do some great ones and yeah, lots of organisations and I think it's an important part of what we're doing, um, definitely. Um, an interesting comment from Ian Gould um, as well saying that actually not linking the headland margin to the infield margin, has um, they found it has had an additional benefit it makes it harder for foxes and badgers to get into the strip and then actually there's big benefits for um, ground nesting birds and they found that quite a lot at GWCT and Loddington so you know the practical things that work for you as farmers you know also potentially have a, a biodiversity impact and benefit as well and um, just one last question for you both from Andrew Russell saying and um, what method of establishment did you use and how deep were they drilled um, Brian do you want to answer that one first yeah, so we actually pulled the, um, the the primary cultivator around the edge of the field and down the middle of it, and then we just used the power harrow to basically smash it to a small dust in the very dry conditions we had. And then we've got a actual grass seed broadcasting harrow um, for our grass seed anyway. So we just broadcast it in the surface and rolled it. Um, we know that small seeds like wildflowers and everything naturally in the natural environment just shed straight onto the seed surface so they don't want to be drilled very deep at all um, so I'd say broadcasting is by far the best establishment for small seeds for wildflowers. Did yeah absolutely 100% yeah, agree with that we created a good seed bed um, and then um, in in our case we used a horse drill but we I, um, I set it so that actually the feet were about an uh, inch and a half off the floor so it was effectively broadcasting the seed you know, and then using the harrows and the wheels on the drill to just sort of harrow it and roll it in. So um, yeah, definitely broadcast rather than drill. Brilliant, um, thank you both. I was just ah. gonna add one thing uh, to, to this discussion, which was the, the thing to bear in mind is that where you're taking land out of crop production, you've obviously put a huge amount of effort into creating a really fertile soil. Fertile soil is great for grasses, great for weeds. But the flowering plants tend to prefer a lower fertility so you're always going to have a bit of a struggle in the first year to get a really good establishment because the soil just isn't isn't uh, appropriate for that so it can take some time to, to establish these these um, strips so don't be surprised at that you just need to manage it accordingly and if you're mowing um, and topping where possible try and take away the the, um, the cuttings because that'll help reduce the soil fertility and help promote these beneficial plants I think either you're um, Ian Willoughby is a mind reader because he's also sent exactly that question in, Mark, um, and said, you know, have they considered forage or late hay to reduce fertility whilst getting an additional crop off the strips? And I know it's something you've done quite a bit of, Brian, um, you know, using the green seeds and things as well. So, yeah, I think some of this is establishing this and managing it, you know, and getting them in and, and getting them up. And you want them there for a long time. And um, if anybody is interested in the mixes that have been used, they are slightly different between between the east and the west, um, but they're all listed on the um, in the report. So Rob's you can download, um, and Brian's is available on the website. And um, they're quite a comprehensive list. I know Brian, you were quite nervous about drilling them because of the 
you know the cost of the sea to get them there and established but hopefully they'll be there um, for a while so brilliant thank you very much Brian and Rob I know we'll be back um, in a minute we're going to hand over to Mark now to talk us through um, what the reasons are that you um, well, what we're assessing and then what you started to find Mark so over to you thank you Theresa so uh, my name is Mark Ramston. I'm an entomologist at ADAS and I led the invertebrate monitoring on the strategic farms uh, last year. Um, and my background is really in conservation biological control. So this is aiming to promote natural enemies of crop pests as part of an integrated pest management program. Um, and so what we were doing on the farms was looking at how that's happening on uh, both uh, Brian and Rob's farm and we also did some monitoring on one of the monitor farms on Petworth uh, monitor farm as well. Okay, of the next slide. Thank you. So these were our main objectives um, from the work uh, and it was designed to give us an initial insight. Now as we've just discussed we knew that the establishment of the floral strips um, might take some time so we we didn't really expect there to be a huge impact of these strips in the first year. So what we wanted to do was get a, get a bit of an insight into what species were around um, and, and how that changed, how that varied between the different fields and across the farms. Uh, so that was our main objective. We also wanted to have a look at how those floral strips were establishing. Um, we also knew the seed mixes that have been put in, but that doesn't necessarily reflect what comes up. So we were having a look at the weeds and how that was encroaching into the crop. Uh, and we also had a quick look at uh, trying to measure what effect there was on uh, yield. Uh, and we just did that on Rob's farm, uh, looking at the infield floral strips. Um, I'm not going to talk about that too much today, um, basically because we didn't find a huge impact on yield, apart from the fact that you're taking land out of uh, production. Um, so the picture here is just the floral uh, range of species that were on uh, Rob's farm. Um, and there's quite a mix of different species there. And it's just wanted to raise that there are different properties of these different plants um, at promoting different natural enemies and, and they play different roles in the floral strip. So some of these are very simple flowers that are designed to um, provide uh, nectar for uh, some species of, of beneficial insect. Some of them are, are more used to attract things into the, uh, the strip. So oxide daisy are great for attracting um, insects towards the strip and then there are other species that are actually better at providing the resources, providing the pollen and the nectar. So you really want to have a good range of different species um, going on. Um, not, not also um, because uh, you don't know what's actually going to establish well. So you, you want to try and get a mix going and then um, uh, target your management depending on what comes up. Uh, can I to the next slide please? So these are the assessment methods we used. And we really focused on using assessment methods that could be carried out by anyone on the farm um, using very simple technology. So this, these are uh, designed to make it feasible for you to do some of this yourselves. Um, so we're not focusing here on detailed scientific analysis. The idea was to get a rapid insight into what was happening. Um, so we looked at slugs using uh, baited traps. Uh, we looked at ground dwelling um, insects using pitfall traps and pitfall traps are pretty basic things they are just a container uh, dropped into the ground so that it's level with the soil surface and things running across the, the, the surface of the soil just drop in and then we collect it a few days later and, and see what we've caught and we did some visual assessment of aphids on the cereal crops again just counting what was uh, what was there on the tillers and doing some, um, some uh, assessment of the plant species in and next to the strips. And then we used, our, uh, we used um, yield mapping to look at the, the impact on, on yield. So at this point, we're going to do a very quick poll. Um, and it's just to see how many of you are carrying out these kind of assessments at the moment. So you can select one or more of these or none. Um, and we'll just have a quick look. I think we've, uh, we should just get the results straight up after this. So we want to know, are you doing slow trapping? Are you doing visual assessments for aphids? Are you doing any pitfall trapping? Um, are you looking at the plant species that are coming up on your field margins? Oh, and just, just to say, you have to actually click on the screen um, in order to do this. If you click on the white boxes and that will register you as a um, your poll option. 
And if you're doing other things on the farm that we haven't listed, if you want to pop it in the questions box as well, that's always interesting. Um, so there, we've got about half of you that have voted now. So it's coming up, Mark. So we'll give it another couple of minutes and then if you want to show the results, Christian. Great, so uh, that's that's really great to see that, that um, assessments are going on. It's what we would expect. Um, Obviously, the slight trapping and the visual assessment of aphids are really good ways of, of seeing uh, and monitoring whether you need to do any, trip, any treatment. The pitfall trapping obviously takes a bit more effort, so I'm not surprised that few are doing that. Um, and then the plant species assessments, again, quite time consuming, so I'm not surprised that there's, there's a small proportion. Um, but we'll come back to this at the end of, uh, of the session. Right, so go to the next slide, please. So in terms of the results we found, um, this is what we found from the slug assessments, and this is all in the handout, so I'm not gonna go into detail on the numbers. Um, all I want to do is just, just show you the format that we've put into the handout so you can have a look later on. Um, what you can see is that some fields, particularly at uh, uh, the strategic farm east, had quite high numbers of uh, slugs. Um, so that's that sort of uh, the, the right-hand side set of fields. Um, those are the ones at strategic farm east. And where the cell is red, that's where they're above the threshold for treatment. So where we found an average of more than four slugs per trap. Um, so you, see, you can see there's a few. The main thing is we can see that there's variation between the fields. Um, so, I, I mean, this is all something that you, you are all familiar with. The, the distribution of slugs varies both within and between fields. And that's why it's really important to uh, most of these slugs at a at a subfield level um, in order to, to put treatment in effectively. This is kind of obvious, um, but what we're presenting here is then that when you look at the natural enemies and the other um, invertebrates we looked at, you see that same um, principle. So um, if we go down to the next slide, please. We looked at various different uh, groups of beneficial insects. So these are the different groups we looked at. Um, and in a minute, you'll see that there's variation in these different groups across the farm and uh, across the different farms we looked at. Um, and it's all driven by their different habitat needs and their different ecological roles uh, across the farmland. And so it's no surprise that when we look to monitor these things, you have to take a, a targeted approach when you want to improve habitats to promote them, you really need to be considering what they're needing, what their behavior is around the farm. And it's quite a time consuming um, process to, to, to match treatments against um, a specific promotion of, of particular species. Um, if we go down to the next slide, thanks, Christian. So this, this is a snapshot from the overall table of results um, that's in the handout. Uh, it, again, I'm not gonna go through the numbers, uh, but you can see, for each row here, we've got uh, a different group, either in the autumn assessment or the summer assessment. And you can see that there's variation both between the way that the uh, different groups are distributed across the farms and how they're distributed over time. Uh, and we can see some really high numbers. And I don't know if you'll be able to make out the numbers on this, um, but if we just look at that, that first group of uh, ground beetles, so these are the generalist predators and they're the most common um, group that we would expect to find around uh, farmland and um, we've got quite a range of different numbers going on. If we look at in the summer, in one field we found uh, over 300 of these um, beetles in one field uh, compared to another field where we were only finding one or two uh, at the same time um, for the same sampling effort. So there's quite a big difference there. Now just to pull out that particular one, um, this is on field six which is one of Rob's fields which is why he's popped up here. Um, and uh, that particular field is next to a, uh, a river with some um, particular habitat, which I think, Rob, would you like to just describe to us? Yeah, so it's quite, those numbers are quite interesting and, 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 and whether it's coincidence or whether it's anything to do with the fact that um, it, runs along a, uh, it runs along quite a wide brook and we've had a margin um, up against that brook, which has been 12 meters wide um, it's all, it, it dates all the way back to an old ELS agreement that was in place well before I came here 11 years ago. So, so whether there's anything in the fact that a very long established margin along the boundary of that field 
has built up these numbers over time. Do you think that's, um, do yeah, you think so that's something? For, for a lot of these uh, beneficials, having this undisturbed habitat established over a long period is really good for them. Um, and, and again, it comes back to this point of newly established uh, habitats are good, but it does take time for them to really have an impact on the environment around them. So I think that's what we're seeing here is that the, the long established grassland route and, and associated habitat on that buffer pit strip um, would have would have created a good habitat for these particular beetles. And I was going to well, I was going to mention also the beetle numbers in the other groups is, are, are quite low. Is, is that something that you would expect to these things that we're not usually seeing a lot of anyway? Well, there's 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 a complication here about the way that you monitor these insects and and because the tr way the traps work because they're just trapping things that run on the surface and then drop in they're more likely to catch um, beetles that are more active on the soil surface so we are more likely to find uh, particularly that group one um, uh, ground beetle type because they are quickly running across the soil surface so they're, they're just more likely to fall in so sure. while we can compare um, a particular group between fields we have to be very careful about comparing numbers between beetles because we just we just know that there's a, a behavioral impact on how we collect them. Um, okay. So so I wouldn't read too much into the low numbers, more read along the rows rather than down the columns uh, to get an idea of what's going on. Mark, can you sort of sort of talk about these obviously ground beetles are very important for IPM side. Um, and obviously my numbers look all in the red, which I'm a little bit disappointed with. Um, so I've got to do a bit of homework to see, but what is the life cycle of these ground beetles? What is actually going to do more damage to them? Is it sort of insecticide usage or is it habitat or is it sort of ground disturbance? What's the sort of life cycle of these sort of ground beetles? Yeah, so um, we're looking at this, this okay, 30 or 40 species of ground beetles that are around, they all have their own life cycles, but on the whole, most of them, have an annual life cycle, so they're breeding in either the autumn or the spring summertime, um, and then laying their eggs on the soil surface or, or down into the soil or in um, grassy tussocks, things like that. The larvae then emerge and are generally predaceous. So the, the larvae are also generally predators. There are a few seed eaters around, um, uh, but they're in the soil, so that's where they're active um, underneath the soil or sometimes on the soil surface. Um, where they'll then pupate and emerge uh, within the same year. So uh, on the whole, um, anything that reduces disturbance of the soil is, is going to be good for these, um, for, for ground beetles. Uh, there are some ground beetles that have a, a two year life cycle. And um, these are some of the really big sort of two centimeter ones. Uh, and they're particularly vulnerable to, to cultivation in the fields. Um, uh, but but uh, the, most of them are single year. Um, life cycles. Uh, Hannah, I think you've got a comment as well. I was just going to jump in here to say um, some of the people on the call might have heard of the researcher Kelly Jowett. Um, she's also at Rothamsted and Reading University and she's looking at the movement of these beetle larvae in the ground and trying to, it's a bit more scientific, um, so it's quite challenging, sort of digging pitfall traps that capture them as they're moving through the soil and then looking at how tillage would affect those. So there is research being done on this if, if you wanted to dig into it more. Thanks, Hannah. This is a question for Brian and for Rob and um, kind of having seen these you know is this the first time have you ever kind of consciously gone out and looked at beetles across the farm or you know thought about these um, in there is this the first time you've kind of seen this data with this, this data surprising to you and I know Mark Chandler um, from the Petworth Monitor Farm is on the call I mean if you've got any comments to add in Mark if you want to put them in the questions but a similar kind of question for you um, yeah, I don't know. It's just interesting to hear your reactions, Mark Ramsden. There's not, you know, we haven't done loads of this necessarily in the past in this kind of way, have we? And yeah, just interested in your first impressions um, on this. Certainly, we, we have been doing a lot of wildlife auditing on our farm through farm and birds, moths, butterflies, dragonflies. And now this is obviously going into sort of a bit more sort of detail with the ground bees. It's something that we saw a lot of in when we're doing our grassy we see a lot of ground beetles coming in with the grass but we never really sort of paid an interest into them and then obviously now insecticides are sort of getting very sort of questionable and we haven't actually applied we've only 
sprayed insecticide once this this autumn for BYDV. So we've seen a lot of predation from sort of midges and yeah. and parasitic wasps. So um, it's now opened my eyes that there's a lot of um, sort of detail that we need to sort of look at. And I think as an industry, as a group of farmers, we need to sort of really get to grips with this because we know that the, the, the insecticide question marks are the sort of nails are in the coffin and they're being lined up to be smashed in. So we've got to be much more sort of understanding of our farmed environment. And then with elms, um, with higher tier, with, with everything else coming towards us, there's going to be youth um, sort of habitat that we can put into our into a place, get paid through elms, through higher tier that will benefit our farming system. So it's a win-win if we can learn and get and get more detail and results like this. So it's all it's all good for us really. Yeah, yeah we've we've well. certainly never we've never monitored anything on this on this sort of level at all. So the information that, and the data that Mark and the guys are getting and bringing back is just um, you know it's it's brilliant. We're in a lucky position to be able to host to be able to host a strategic farm and be and um, you know be receiving this sort of um, information directly about our farm and our field. So it's um, no, it's great. Um, one thing I would thinking, well, sorry. <laughs> Um, one thing I did, we have done on our farm is actually put out a call on um, sort of local wildlife trust groups and things like that for people who are really interested in the subject. And it's amazing that some people, some retired, we've got a, reti a retired agronomist who's interested in um, dragonflies and he's now coming on our farm and doing sort of dragonfly audits. Um, so there are people out there who just want to get out and about, especially in lockdown when they've got an interest, but they can't sort of get out as much as they want to. It gives them a real opportunity to sort of get some information about your farm. So farm and birds, bird counts, all this sort of stuff. There's people out there who want to get on farm. So um, sort of open your farm gate to them, I'd say. What were you going yeah, to say, Matt? Well, I think um, what we did was a, was a snapshot. We looked just at one week, we did it across the farms. Um, and it gives you a good idea of, of what's present and absent and some idea of the different numbers, but it's by no means ideal in really understanding what's going on. Now, that snapshot was quite a lot of, of time uh, to do and, and does require a, a fair understanding of the um, identifying these different species. So it is something that's probably out of scope for you to do on your farm to, to really look in detail at how these insects are changing over time and what's present, but that shouldn't put you off just having a look and I and we'll I'll try and re, um, restate this again later but just putting in a pitfall trap and looking and seeing what you're finding is a really good first step doesn't matter if you don't know what the beetle is that you found in there um, and it doesn't matter um, if if you've only looked at one trap or, or half a dozen or whatever just having a go and familiarizing yourself with the kind of things that are, are out, out and about at different times of year is a really worthwhile activity and Mark, if you were going to have a couple and just get, a, we literally, it's just a, a plastic pot, isn't it, kind of dug into the ground. Is there a good crop to put it in or a good time to do it or a good place in the field that you'd kind of suggest or? The, the best times to do it would be um, early autumn and uh, and then around about April, May, maybe April sort of time. And then, and then June. June is when you'll catch the most things. So it's probably the most interesting time to do it. Uh, and there is a handout that's that's got a bit of guidance on how to put these traps in. I think it's one of the ones attached. So um, yeah. take, do take a look and, and feel free to share what you find with us and we can have a look and, and help you understand it better. And is there kind of numbers that you think are, are good numbers or things to look out for? Or I wouldn't I wouldn't put a number on things at this stage. I think what you're looking for is, is presence, absence. Are you finding lots of things? Are you finding nothing? Um, I wouldn't, there's, there's no kind of threshold of, of, of activity that we can really pin down at this stage. Yeah. Um, and because there's so much variation, yeah, you, you, you really want to be looking around your farm and comparing on your own farm rather than to a, to a number at this stage. Yeah, and um, it's worth saying, Mark, isn't it, that if you're interested in the detail, there's so much detail, and we were kind of discussing, weren't we, how much detail we go into today. So there's a lot more detail in the harvest reports, and all of this, um, the encyclopedia for um, pests and natural enemies is um, from the HDB, the kind of the thick blue book um, has got all of this in, and all the ID and everything, Mark, hasn't it, the life cycles. So that's free um, to get. Thank you, Hannah. I think you're going to show I, one. Then. Oh, well, and so, I've, got, 
I have got the encyclopedia in the box behind me, but there's also some guides that I think are quite useful from the Field Studies Council. Um, so they're obviously not the AHGB, but I find them quite good because they've got pictures. Um, so these are the bee and butterfly ones that just happen to be on my desk, which fit into a kind of tractor cab pickup if you're interested, obviously not beetles, but just generally um, can start helping you recognise what's flying around. I feel like yeah. it's an advert, but if you're really interested in ground beetles, this one is amazing. <laughs> I can What's I can stick to it. It's um, Naturalist Handbook number eight, so it's 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 ground beetles. Uh, hang on, that one. Yeah. Again, okay. found on my desk. But it, uh, there are some really good, useful tools out there, and they are accessible generally. So um, do do have a look if you're more interested. Do get in touch if you want us to point you in the right direction. Lovely. Just um, a couple of points as well um, that popped up. So Mark Chandler from the Petworth Monitor Farm, who are um, the fields that are on there, he said um, that their fields have been direct drilled for three years, um, which is maybe why the beetle numbers are looking OK. Um, but he said it's interesting there's no significant difference between the treatment fields. Um, is that because they're, that's too early um, to kind of yeah. say yet? Or do you think you'll see that more as we go forward? Or is that the year that we've just had, Mark? Is there any comments on that? Absolutely. So um, the first thing is about the ground beetles. Now, the ground beetles, their life cycle doesn't require uh, nectar or pollen. So we wouldn't actually expect the nectar or pollen elements of those floral strips to have a huge impact on the ground beetles. What they will benefit from is the fact that there's an undisturbed strip with grassy habitat that's established within the crop where they can use that as refuge. Um, so during the winter where it gets colder, they can use the tusky grasses. And they're really good uh, at providing a bit of shelter for them. Um, and then uh, during treatment, or so if there's something going on in the crop, they, then you've got a, a, an area of refuge that they can um, move back into the crop from afterwards. So, so we wouldn't have expected any impact of the floor strips in the first year um, at all, because they just weren't providing any, any resource for them. Um, but, but tusky grasses, uh, grass strips, and any kind of floor strip are gonna have an impact over time for sure. And that's really what we see in those group ones that we talked about on, on uh, Rob's farm, where there's been this long established grassy habitat effectively that's helped build the numbers up over time in that, in that habitat, but also in the surrounding area. Um, we will expect to, well, we hope to see some impact of the floor strips next year. I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. I know we're probably getting on for time now. One last and um, quick thing, the pots, um, a question about should they have holes in the bottom for drainage or should they actually have a bit of water in the bottom? I've just asked that. Yeah, before. so uh, what the easiest way to do, what I've done in the past, the cheapest way is to use plastic pint glasses and you have two plastic pint glasses or a yogurt pot, whatever you've got to hand. Um, apparently I have pint glasses. So you take the first one and you make a small hole in the bottom so that water can run through. That's the one you put into the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you put the second one, you have some salt water um, in the bottom of that, maybe a third full. And you put that inside the first one. Uh, what that means is that uh, anything that drops into the, the trap falls into the salt solution and will, um, will be killed by that, which means that they won't eat everything else that falls in. Um, so you've got a better chance. It'll also preserve it so it doesn't get quite so mucky in there. Um, and the first one is there so that if you've got uh, rainfall or something, it reduces the chance that the, the soil is going to shift too much and, and just pop your uh, trap out. I wouldn't suggest leaving them more than a few days anyway. Um, and you can leave them just overnight and you'll, you'll find one or two things. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Brian's just said as well as the kind of encyclopedias and those guys, actually social media is great um, for if you've got a, a picture of what have I found and um, tag a few key people in there so we can maybe have a session about who to tag in um, later. So yeah, I'll hand over to you Mark to finish up your couple of slides. Yeah, thank you. Um, go to the next slide. So uh, this was the results from the aphids monitoring. We, have, we monitored aphids and we also counted the number of aphids that have been parasitized by wasps forming these uh, mummies. And we also counted the number of, of predators and we've, we've bought those all together. Now, um, the numbers we found last year during at growth stage 60 were, were very low. Um, it was just a low, low, uh, a low year for aphids in these across the farms. Um, so we didn't find uh, anything particularly spectacular. But again, you can see there's a lot of variation going on between the fields um, uh, and, and similar variation in the mummies and in the 
uh, a through process. This this was really to give us a quick insight, um, and it, again, it's something you can do on your um, on your farms very easily. And it seems that quite a few of you are doing it. Uh, next year, we're going to look at at um, aphids and, and other pests on on the crops in a bit more detail over time. So, and um, we'll come back to that uh, in the future. Um, can the next slide, please. So this uh, is just to give you an idea of some actions that you could be taking, and we're we're, we're coming back onto what we've been discussing really. Um, the kind of things you can do is, is some pitfall trapping, so putting these pitfalls uh, into the ground. I would say if you just want a quick look, see a quick go at this, then just putting one uh, in a field margin and one in the crop next to it and see what the difference is. Um, just just for your own interest as a as a first point, that's quite a useful thing to do. Um, it looked like quite a few of you are already doing slug baiting uh, traps, um, so it's just good to keep doing that. But also have a look at how things change over time. Um, and in fact, if you could do the two of these together. So you could look at what are you finding, um, what kind of beetles are you finding, and then does that have an impact on what the slugs are you finding in the following weeks? Um, so sometimes you can pick up on that quite well. Um, I would definitely recommend looking around your, your farm as a whole and seeing where any floor resources or other resources for beneficials is uh, currently located um, and um, whether you're seeing different things happening around there and whether there's some gaps around your farm because what you really want is a spread of these resources across the landscape rather than all um, bolt together in one corner of the farm. And in terms of creating uh, habitat, um, there is almost a standard, a lack of floral resources across agricultural landscapes. So if you're going to pick up on one, that's why there is a lot of talk about promoting floral resources, because we know that it's something that's missing. We know it's very useful to a lot of um, insects um, and we know it's something that can be achieved fairly quickly within a few years. But it does take a few years. So do um, do consider how you're going to manage it and do, do think about how it fits in with a long term strategy on the farm. Uh, if you have the final slide. So next year, we're going to be looking much more at the, uh, the beneficial insects that will be using the floral strip. So this is the um, the, the beneficials that use flower, uh, floral nectar and pollen. Um, uh, often the adults of these species uh, require the floral resources, whereas the, the larvae are the ones who are actually um, eating the prey, eating the pests in the crop. So um, we'll be looking at how those floral strips are having an impact on those species um, in the three fields, so well, with, with and without uh, floral strips around and inside them. Uh, and we'll be doing a series of monitoring this time. So rather than looking at a snapshot, we'll be looking at how things change over time um, and seeing uh, how, how big an impact the floral strips are have it, having. Uh, we'll also be looking at a slightly wider range of beneficials. So we, we are looking at um, the obvious ones, the hoverflies and, and ladybirds, but we'll also take a look at some pollinators as well and, and, um, and see what other pests we might be uh, finding in the traps. Um, so that was my last slide. Very happy to answer any further questions that haven't been addressed already. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, there are lots of questions coming in. Um, I think what we might do is go through Hannah's presentation as well, because there's some really nice kind of links and elements of it, and then come back to a panel discussion. Um, if that's all right. Yeah. Lots of questions, but I think actually it'd be really nice um, to pick up some of the points with Hannah and then we'll come back. So thank you so much, Mark. There's no yeah, so much that we've started doing and a lot more exciting things to, to go. So yeah, we'll get you ready for some questions in a minute. Um, but yeah, before we do that, I'll just hand over to you, Hannah, um, to talk through your work that you've been doing. Okay, wonderful. So my name's Hannah. I'm a final year Waitrose PhD student based at Rothamsted and Reading. So we can jump straight in and move on to the first slide. So today I'll be telling you about kind of three main things. The first is a little bit of the brief um, theory behind my PhD. Don't worry, we're not going into it massively. And then the kind of questions I'm asking, then the sampling I'm doing to answer those questions. And then finally, we're going to focus on the harvest data. So if we jump into it with the next slide. So in carrots, um, the main problem are two types of aphid, willow carrot aphid and peach potato aphid, which can transmit transmit viruses to those carrot plants, um, which ultimately lead to either plant death or kind of ugly carrots which can't be sold. And these carrots that have been affected by the virus are a problem for growers as they can lose up to 15% of their yields in the crop. 
Um, but more generally, though, a project like mine is about providing all kinds of growers with the evidence and relevant evidence that they need to think about those kind of IPM programs and a specific focus on in, uh, reducing insecticide use. And then on the right hand side of the slide here, you can see Ben Madrasi. He's the Hunterpack Farm Director. Um, now, Hunterpack are fairly typical within the horticulture sector um, and they mainly farm on annually rented land and they generally rely on insecticides to control their aphid problems. Um, so, Ben is keen to look for a more sustainable approach and his idea is to look into these flowering strips and how we can plant these in and around his fields. Um, so we can go on to the next slide and we can think about why would a flowering strip even have an effect on aphids? Well, um, as uh, Mark introduced, we're looking to exploit a principle called conservation biological control. Um, and here it's about providing natural enemies with shelter, nectar, alternative food and pollen, which we can then, by providing these resources, hopefully build up their numbers. And then these natural enemies, as we said, will kind of go into the crop um, and hopefully predate the aphids, which transmit those viruses, um, which cause the yield losses. And by providing um, these flowering strips with nectar and pollen, we should also be able to support pollinators. So great, let's go and chuck some flowers into a field. Um, but unfortunately, like all things in life, it's not quite that simple. So um, as Mark had alluded to, we know that different insects have different requirements for shelter, nectar, alternative food and pollen at different times of the year and through different life stages. Um, so it sounds quite complicated, but basically what we've done by working with Ben is identify the carrots that are sown um, in kind of early May which are the most susceptible to these carrot viruses. So we're looking at the potential flowers that could increase the natural enemy populations to target those specific window of flowers and being quite specific. So if we go on to the next slide, we should be able to see this is the kind of main question that my PhD is asking. So what's the best mix of annual flowers that we can put into carrot fields to support both pest control and pollination? So how do I answer that question, which is the next slide, and that involves a lot of sampling. Um, and we can actually, I'm quite lucky, I can show you my experimental treatments. So that sampling um, is in the, these kinds of carrot fields. So this is a nine hectare carrot field from Shropshire last year, so 2019. Um, so you can see the carrots growing in their kind of two meter wide beds in the length of the field. And then in the middle, we've taken one of those beds out of production and then swapped it for different kinds of flowers. So as you look along the length of the strip, you can see the flowers changing color, which is indicating our different flowering treatments. So um, then we can go on to the next bit. Um, so we've looked at lots of things in this field and the first thing we've sampled um, is that vegetation themselves, so is the strips themselves, thinking about how well have they established, what are the dominant species, weeds, etc., those kinds of things. The next thing we've looked at is the virus, which has caused the crop loss. And so we want to know if there are different levels of virus between the different flowering strip treatments. Um, I'm not a molecular biologist. I have an allergy to lab, uh, white lab coats. Um, so this is part work that's being carried out as part of a collaboration um, with Ferrer and uh, Newcastle. Um, so I'm not doing the, yeah, I'm collecting the samples and they're analyzing the samples and this should hopefully reveal virus differences between the treatments. The next thing we're looking at is the aphid counts. So for the virus to have appeared in the plant, we're looking to see if we've got different aphids which transmit the virus. And in particular, are there different numbers of aphids in the crop? And are there different numbers of natural enemies between those treatments too? With the idea being that uh, better performing flower mixes would have fewer aphids um, next to it. Then the next thing we are looking at is the insect communities. So are there more or perhaps different natural enemy communities as well as thinking about those pollinators using the flowers too? Um, to sample those, we've used water traps um, that you might be familiar with, kind of yellow water traps. And then we've also used something called a flower insect time count, um, which sounds fancy, but is literally standing and looking at the insects which visit flowers over a 10 minute period. And it's the kind of thing um, you can do yourselves by looking at a certain area of flowers and just sort of seeing how many, of it, how many different insects are visiting and, and doing that around different areas of your farm just to get kind of familiar with what you've got. Now, um, the next thing we're looking at is these sentinel cards, um, because everything we've sort of spoken about here so far is a kind of passive observation of what's going on. 
um, but we also wanted to have a kind of more manipulative way of looking at the pest control that might be coming off of these flowering strips and um, so to do that we take a bit of card um, and we stick we glue five aphids onto that card we put those cards into the crop and then 24 hours later we go back and we count the number of aphids left on those cards and the idea would be that strips that support or treatments that support more natural enemies would lead to fewer aphids left on the cards. And then finally, we've got the results from the harvest of the carrots. Um, so if we go on to the next one, we've got a picture of the virus eating carrots or not. I don't know if there we go. Um, so on the left, you can see what a carrot that looks um, that's been affected by virus. So um, that sort of split root and the dark discoloration. Um, and then on the right, you've obviously got a normal carrot. So um, I think you can click again, Christian, it should hopefully disappear. Um, so to get these carrots, um, we've dug up a kind of four meter squared area next to each treatment that we've harvested, washed and then graded to commercial specifications. And what this basically means is I've gone along and looked at every carrot, assessed, um, assessed them, seeing if there's any defects, so insect pests, fungal damage, misshapen roots, all of those kinds of things. Um, and also thinking about the sizes of those carrots. And then with that data, we can then look to see what the quality and the yield of the carrots are in those different um, treatments. And again, expecting that if those conservation biological control principles have led to us having more natural enemies, then there should be kind of less pest damaged carrots. So great. What did we find from this field? Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I can tell you that perhaps unsurprisingly by the sheer number of flowers in those fields we know we can increase the numbers of these useful insects um, but and this is where it kind of gets really tricky is that we know it's not just about counting those ladybirds um, but we've also got to quantify or assess the impact of those ladybirds on the crop but, you know if we're taking land out of production we want to make sure that their yield is offset somehow um, elsewhere and that's really what makes this project kind of new and interesting and special is the fact that we're looking at all of those natural enemies and then the impact on the crop. Um, unfortunately, though, um, from this field, we've not found any significant differences in those kind of crop relevant things that we've looked at. So we haven't found differences in aphid numbers. We haven't found differences in the predation of those aphids. Um, on those little sticky cards, um, nor have we found differences in the amount of kind of virusy carrots between those treatments. Um, but it's still useful to look at this data, um, and so we can go on to the next slide um, when we look at this harvest data, and then we can go through to look at a table. It looks quite intimidating, don't worry, we're going to go through it. So on the left hand side in very blue, um, we've got the different flowering treatments. So at the top, we've got a carrot control and then we've got our five different flowering mixes below them. Um, we're calling each treatment by a letter, not because I'm not eventually going to tell people what these treatments are, but just because this data comes from hunter packs fields and um, some of the trials have still got carrots in the ground. We want them to be able to see all of the data as they're the ones kind of who, who facilitated this. Um, but then once we're sure of the results and we can get them checked, we can then start publishing them and shouting about them probably quite a lot on Twitter. Um, so in this table, the next things we've got in grey, um, the factor that we're particularly interested in is the percentage of carrots that would have been rejected in the pack house because they had the symptoms of the virus, so those ugly carrots we saw before. Um, but as I said, if you look at these numbers, we haven't really got differences between treatments in these virus levels. The next thing we've got is the percentage of a sample affected by cavity spot. For those of you who um, aren't obsessed with carrots like I seem to be, um, cavity spot is a fungal pathogen. Um, now, given that these carrots that we've harvested weren't sprayed with any fungicides, we've got quite high values for cavity spot rejections. Um, we don't think that there is any particular relationship between our flowering mixes and these cavity spot rejections. But I've included these numbers for you today because I think this is probably the factor that is driving the final differences in yield between the treatments, not the virus factors that we should hopefully be influencing. Then we've got uh, a column labelled percentage pack out, which takes um, into account all of the rejections, so nematode damage or misshapen carrots, and it takes those out and leaves you with the kind of the percentage of sellable carrots. And the little markers next to the number in these columns represent statistical differences. So we know treatments B and D had a significantly higher quality or a higher pack out than the others. 
And then the final three columns in that darker blue are the most commercially relevant data. So we've got gross yield of washed carrots. And then by multiplying that gross yield, you can um, multiplying the gross yield by the kind of percentage of your quality, you can get a kind of net yield of carrots that you could sell. And then by using a kind of wholesale price, which is about right, it's not necessarily what Hunter Pack used, but it's about right for 40 pence per kilogram of washed carrots. We can then calculate the kind of net price um, before you've taken all of the other costs away that these carrots would have been sold at in terms of pounds um, per acre. And I think it's just, it's a lot of numbers, but what am I trying to say with this? Um, if you look at something like treatment B, um, it has a higher pack out, so higher quality than the control carrots. It's gross yield is okay, it's not great, but then because that quality is high, you get a higher net yield and a net turnover. And again, if you look now at the gross yield of treatment F, it's the second highest with 37.6 tonnes per acre, but then this has the lowest quality and therefore the lowest yet net yield and the lowest price when you sell those carrots. And I think it's really important to have a conversation around this about yield versus quality, um, perhaps more apparent in horticulture than arable, I will admit. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I will admit that I've been a little bit cheeky by showing you um, that table by giving you kind of absolute fixed values for these um, numbers. In reality, when we look here at a graph of the range of different kind of net prices in terms of pounds per ton, uh, pounds per hectare, I think, sorry, um, for each treatment, you can see there are a range of values for each of these treatments. Um, but nevertheless, the kind of story that we're, we're telling you is still relevant. And then just maybe something for the discussion afterwards, I'll point out here that treatment F, which had the lowest net mean price, or mean net price, sorry, so the, the kind of least profitable carrot, so to speak, was actually one of the strongest mixes for pollinators. Um, so there's a question there kind of around retailers and consumers and, and farmers and growers, you know, it's about how would we in this case um, fund supporting pollinator health if that's one of our priorities. So we'll go on to the next slide um, when I will say something quite controversial, which um, to hopefully challenge the fact that I've just spent a lot of time talking about harvest and economic data with you um, and say, so what? Does this matter? Does the evidence matter? So how many of you um, know the amount of damage that each pest or pathogen causes from field to field? How many of you know or could quantify or count the, the loss caused by each of those? How many of you could say we've spent this much on the protection or treatment of those different uh, issues? And how many of you would know the kind of economic thresholds for those pests and those treatments? Because I'm guessing that not all, all farmers do. And again, I'm not saying this because I'm attacking you from my ivory tower. But what I want to know is um, how do you make decisions? What evidence would you need to know to assess an in strip, an in field strips effectiveness? You know, what would persuade you to put these strips in? What is the useful evidence that researchers like me can be finding? Because perhaps you don't even know that that's the evidence you need yet to be persuaded. Um, so I will just move on to conclude now then with the next slide, which basically says, hopefully from the pretty photos, which have all come from um, my trials, it is entirely possible for you to get these in-field strips in within the kind of operational and machinery constraints and these flowers have all um, tolerated the conditions well and in fact all of them have been hit accidentally with herbicide and it doesn't take a PhD to realise that um, herbicide and wildflowers don't always go but you'll be able to see that even with some operational impacts you know they they've still um, coped and hopefully it should reduce the kind of your perceptions of risk so to speak. Um, and then the next thing I'd say is what can you do on your own farms and I would ask what do you want to achieve? You know, are you trying to target a specific insect pest or are you talking about all pests? What natural enemies, you know, are you trying to attract for those pests? Um, are we talking beetles, hoverflies, ladybirds, those kinds of things? Where are those pests on your farm generally? Are they in the middle of the field or are they around the outside of the field? What kind of wildflowers would suit your soil? You know, are, is there some random local butterfly that you used to have, you know, 60 years ago um, that you have lost now? You know, are there specific things you're trying to target? So having a think about that is really useful. 
And then I'd say, how can these infield strips work in the context of your own land, but also, or your own farm? Um, but what about your neighbours? You know, do you have good natural habitat already on your farm? Um, because we need, you know, it's very hard to encourage beetles or ladybirds or pollinators if they aren't there. You know, we need to have a diverse connected landscape. We can't just have carrot fields with annual flowers everywhere. Um, so at that point, I will stop talking um, and just move on to the last slide to say thank you um, and also just acknowledge the Hunter Pack Farm team who have been um, willing and um, helpful when I'm like, great, let's go take some flowers out, uh, put some flowers in their carrot fields. So yes, that is me finished rambling on at you. <laughs> Uh, it's absolutely fantastic, Hannah. Thank you so much. There's um, so much involved and yeah, interesting. And you've certainly posed some really thought provoking questions um, for us all to think about there as well. So I don't know, I'll just invite um, Brian, Rob and Mark um, to come back and join us. Um, there's, a, there's lots of questions that have come in. Hannah, I might give you um, one of the questions that I was thinking about as well is um, from Chris, would it be better if you had a lot more of the strips across the field? Was there a reason that you went just for the one um, strip so in the middle? We've got one strip in the middle. You can see just on the left hand side of this image, there is kind of some flowers. We had this field, there were, there were two strips. Um, this was just because of the experimental design. This isn't necessarily how we would roll it out into carrot fields. And we are looking at the technical term is spillover. So um, how these natural enemies move into the crop. So hopefully um, by the end of my project, I'll be able to say, ideally you would have one every hectare, one every hundred meters, that kind of thing. Um, so I can't answer that question yet, but it is something we're thinking about and it's something that you should be keeping in mind. And, and related to that, um, there was a question right at the beginning about, um, so the infield strips um, that you've established, um, Brian and Rob, were six metres wide, um, presumably to allow the use of existing kit, but could a similar benefit come from a two or three metre wide strip, thus using up less land? Um, I don't know, Rob, Brian, was that a kind of thing that you were advised to do six metres for a particular reason, or do you think a narrower one? Hannah, I get how wide's your beds? Two metres. Two metres, yeah. Um, I think I think most of it is really does just work around the equipment you've got. What's what's the most practical thing for you to do? So if you've got an eight meter drill, then it'll be an eight meter strip. If you've got a four meter drill, then obviously you can do a four or an eight. Um, I don't. I haven't seen anything to suggest it needs to be a minimum of X or a maximum of X, but I'm sure that. I'm sure there will be a, a minimum of one meter wide. You, you, you know, it's obviously not going to yield the benefits of a, of a four or six or an eight meter. Mark, any comments on that in addition? Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, I would say the width has an impact, but much more important is the length. Um, you, you're better to have strips that go a, a further distance if they're two meters by 200 meters as opposed to six meters by 10 meters, I would take the longer one over the shorter one for sure. So, um, but it, as Rob said, it really depends on what, what you've got available to um, to actually put these in the ground. Um, obviously the wider ones have a bit more of a, a buffer around the edges. If you do have a bit of um, issues with herbicide or whatever, then then you've got that slightly more wiggle room, but um, yeah, whatever, whatever you can make to work really. Yeah, and I think Hannah, you know that, that balance and that kind of thing that you were talking about of we're putting these strips in we're taking land out of production the effect on the economics and you know mark i know you mentioned that that was something that we're looking at and i know rob and brian that's you know it's a kind of a key question for us as we go forward we're kind of in the early stages of ours and our establishment and um, but yeah it's the same for all of us hannah whether it's the shocking numbers i was trying to work all that out in hectares i don't know if brian and rob were doing the same but the numbers and margins and things you were quoting and, and ours but, um I, for me i think if as a horticulture kind of sector uh, are looking at this on the high value crops then you know we've got the same um kind of thing to do and um, a question brian i'll give this one to you um, gives Christopher some um, feed reassurance. Um, he said he tried to establish a wildflower mix um, in the autumn at the end of September, but it isn't showing up yet. Will it turn up in the spring? Uh, I'm sure it would do. Um, our stuff that we did in the autumn is sort of just poking its head through now, so I'm sure it's it's there. But 
sometimes they need the right conditions, the right temperature just to sort of get themselves going. Um, just one thing that sort of we've done on our farm when we've used um, high level stewardship and higher tier to basically take out parts of our farm, but we've gone for the, the, the obvious blocks and we've never done much linear work. And I think now with Elms, with development of um, countryside stewardship, more linear options will be what I'm looking at. We looked at it from our conservation side of it was very much um, habitat networking and giving them the right habitat for farmland birds. And so now we're then probably going to look at more flowering margins for farming benefit um, in the right location. So it's, it's something that there, there's, there's money available, there's funding available. If you're planning a higher tier or a mid tier, then there's lots of options. Floral enhanced margins are paid for and they get paid quite well for. Um, and I think they, they will be giving you a benefit, not just um, for sort of everything we discussed, but also that sort of nice color around the farm that sort of does change your, your, your attitude when you start seeing all these things come into flower, they do look fantastic. And so that's something that we sort of will be looking at when we next change our stewardship agreement um, in the next couple of years. I would add. Go on. So I just add to that that what we often what we often see is that when you put these strips in, they'll have an effect, but not necessarily where you expected to see an effect, because a lot of these uh, beneficials are, are quite mobile species. So you can put them in in one field, and you measure that field, and, and you don't see very much, but sort of over around the, the rest of the landscape, you are getting an impact. Um, so I would say it, it's good to do this on multiple fields. Don't feel like you should do it on one field and expect a result there. Have a look at the whole landscape and try and build up that habitat across the whole area. And that, that's where you'll see a much better long term benefit coming back to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, Richard Barnes has kindly reminded me as well that um, option AB8 in countryside stewardship pays £539 per hectare per year. Um, you know, which, as he said, will cover your seed and establishment costs um, over five years and then beyond. And actually, maybe those strips could then be rolled into elms or things going forward. So like Brian says, you know, there are there is support out there um, for establishing these at the moment. Um, a question um, generally, um, I'll probably ask Rob and Brian this, Hannah, I don't think it's fair on you necessarily, but if you've got anything to add about seed rates, um, but have any of you had any experience in altering seed rates on infield strips or margins? Um, Gavin's saying they seem to be given mixes with set rates per hectare based on an average soil type, but could heavy land farms benefit from buying straights rather than seed mixes and increasing certain rates of flower types? So I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier, Brian, about kind of mixing those couple of mixes, thinking about the soil type that you're on. Um, any other points on that? Yeah, we, we bought two different mixes because um, one, we wanted more flowers, but then we knew that some flowers we wanted to really go for the ones which grew on our soil, soil type, sort of clay loam. So um, we sort of mixed two together, but it comes down to sort of cost at the end of the day with all this sort of stuff. Um, but we went for an expensive mix because we wanted diversity in multiple species. And, and it all comes down to sort of biodiversity and you need to have lots of something. And as Rob's seen, that some species do well on certain fields and others do better in other places. So the more diverse seeds you put in the ground, you're hopefully going to get a better sward later day. And it's going to be a really interesting time trying to identify them all. And I sort of am going to look forward to them when they all start blooming just to see what actually is going to come up. So it's, um, yeah, I'd say diversity, lots of different species, but straights and mixing them, I wouldn't do it. I would just go with the advice. There's lots of seed companies out there who have done a lot of more work than what you would do is putting straights in. So take the advice from the best people. And there's some brilliant people out there. And I'm sure there's lots on Twitter that would sort of highlight that as well. Okay. Yeah, ours was ours was just the same. It was the same seed mix. It was the same seed rate. And it was across very varied um, types of uh, of soil, so um, uh, yeah, there's probably work to be done. If, if you know, if there's a certain species you know could be uh, could establish very, very well on certain soils, and you didn't want that in there to become too abundant, you you could start and mess around with it. But like Brian says, 
there are other people that have done way more work on this than than we have. We were very much being led with um, you know one mix and and one flat rate. Brilliant. And following on from that, Hannah, a question for you: Was the flowering strip drilled at the same time as the carrots were drilled? And if so, was it that the flowering strip wasn't yet attracting the beneficials by the time the first aphids were arriving in the crop? I don't know if you can answer that. So this is one of the, the things that we were struggling with because obviously these are spring sown carrots and we're trying to put spring sown annual mixes. So you know it's the right question to ask. Um, that's why we tried to plant a range of different flowers to, to pick competitive ones that will come up. Um, so something like the mustards are the earliest getting up. Um, but again, it, it can be a little bit late. And one of the things that we know with horticulture is they're spraying a lot more than arable um, in, in terms of their insecticide. So um, perhaps we can't hit the very first early migration. Perhaps they're going to rely on insecticides for that. But if we can then shift their reliance later on in the season when these strips are up, and as you can see, um, if we had better technology, I'd show you a video of how busy these um, these strips are. Um, it doesn't, you know, we can support these beneficials maybe later on. So in terms of targeting that early migration, yeah, it's challenging. And in an ideal world, we wouldn't be farming on, or in an ideal world, if I had all of the power I had, you know, we wouldn't necessarily be farming rented land in this way. And we'd have these strips year on year, building up annuals aren't always going to be the solution to a problem. But I think, yeah, um, targeting those aphids when we want to is challenging, but maybe we can help later on in the season. And generally for farming, you know, a whole farm approach or a whole landscape approach, can we build the beneficials up so pest numbers generally are lower because you've got a thriving community of natural enemies year on year if we're doing this in a larger proportion of fields. And so, you know, it is difficult, but I am hopeful. And um, have you looked at, you know, you only looking at this strip and there's a question about have you looked at the other habitat that's, you know, around these sites and around the field and are you taking that into account? Yeah, so that's um, hopefully I was, so this is uh, last year where we've got kind of two strips in one field. This year we've got, we had um, sort of eight strips in fields basically in different fields. So uh, we have built this up. We are taking the landscape into consideration. It's just the statistics is a little bit more complicated for me to, to present and, and show you that straight away. But it is something we try and take into consideration. Um, but yeah, it's quite it's, it's challenging. Um, so the data will be out there for people to tell, talk about, but it will be in sort of 12 months time. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, and um, Chris has written in to say they don't actually crop um, tram lines. He's growing brassicas as they found the yield drops and the quality issues on the tram lines. So actually, maybe it can fit in with that method. And, you know, maybe there's clever ways we can do it. I know um, potato growers are sometimes looking at putting things around the outside and yeah. Um, for doing it good uh, right where are we going to go next um as a question mark i'll um go for you about um something simple like counting worms in the soil is that a worthwhile activity for general biological health and does kind of worm numbers have any correlation to beetles and things like do you need to be counting everything or are there specific species that you can um look at uh, well, in terms of counting worms, uh, that, that is a worthwhile activity. Um, and I know Brian's been doing quite a lot of that around his farm. Um, and it's, it's a quite a good indicator of soil health. So it's quite a good way of understanding um, how, how your soil is performing and, and where you might need to pay more attention. Um, in terms of its correlation to beetles, I'm not aware of any, any major links there. Um, although there are going to be correlations because if the soil is healthy, you, you're going to have a better environment for, for the beetles as well. And there are some beetles that, that may directly um, uh, link to, to earthworms. So there are some of those ground beetles will eat earthworms, not to an extent that they're going to damage the populations, but there may be a link there with some of the species. So, um, I mean, as a general point, I'd say that the more you're engaging with the, the plants and the insects and the rest of the wildlife around your farm, the better you're going to be at managing it. And so you can't monitor everything, but certainly taking a look at what's there uh, and taking a bit of time to, to um, look at the species you're seeing and, and understand what their role is, is absolutely a worthwhile activity. And you don't need to go into super detail on everything you see. You just taking the time to, to make a note of what you are seeing is gonna help you manage your farm better. 
And there's a similar kind of point here that Colin sent through about in reality on farms kind of evidence in one year doesn't necessarily have the same impact in subsequent years. And it actually can be quite costly if it goes wrong and we have to wait another year to, to have a go. I, I don't know, Mark, Hannah, have you got any thoughts on that kind of, you know, like you said, Mark, it's kind of learning and have a baselining and, and knowing what you've got. And then maybe actually you can start to use that to your advantage in future yeah. years. Any points think... on that? It relates to one of the other questions as well, which was, um, let me just make sure I've got it up in front of me, um, whether there will be any guidance or interpretation of beneficials in relation to a need to spray. And, and it's the same point for, for both of these, that what you should be trying to do is, is provide these resources for the beneficials. But in terms of making pest management decisions, you need to be monitoring the pest itself and its impact on the crop. And that's always going to be your, your go-to for making a decision about whether to treat. You know, the things like forecasting tools and things to promote beneficials are really good tools to help you promote beneficials in your landscape and to make sure that you're reducing the risk of damage to the crop. But ultimately, um, you need to be measuring the, the actual impact of the pest on the crop to make a decision about whether you need to spray uh, and how the that in-year impact is, is going on. Anything to add to that, Hannah? Yeah. I was just going to jump in. So I think there were kind of two points in terms of you know, these going wrong. Well, I, I think it depends on what you're trying to support. And that's why we try to do things like pest control and pollination, but you could also do um, sort of drift or if you're looking at soil health, you know, lots of these can contain clovers and things. So basically, if you have a strip that does lots of different things, then if one of the functions doesn't happen in a year, then, you know, it's not the end of the world if it's also supporting other things. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is in terms of costliness of these, um, is it about having these performing every year or is it about having a strip like this performing when you have particularly high aphids? And um, okay, maybe the margins in arable are too small, maybe in horticulture is where it really makes a difference. But if you have a really bad year where you're losing 15% of your crop, if you could then reduce that to 7% of your crop because of these flowering strips, what is the cost that you have saved because of these strips and does that maybe over a five-year period kind of average out I think that kind of makes sense so it's hard looking at an intervention like this in a silo of one year although it is obviously an annual crop maybe that's where uh, the savings that you guys might see in kind of perennial strips in a kind of I don't know how many years your rotation is whether it's a three five or seven year rotation you know maybe that's where the the savings are made in one of those years that's particularly hard hit um so yeah and actually the, the opposite way around one of the conversations I had um with a gentleman in Australia who's got cotton he's he's actually done it the opposite way around that actually it will work every year and then only in a really bad year he's then maybe had to use an insecticide you know and, and actually looking at that kind of managing it that way around um right I think we're getting there um with the answers um the, there's a couple of questions about kind of beneficials and cabbage stone flea beetle um and is that kind of an area that's being researched um in the handout there's um one of the handouts is I've got this pest what is the beneficials I'm looking for and vice versa I've got these beneficials what pest will it do so I'd recommend having a look at that handout and um, there's a specific question here about planting um, a companion crop between sugar beet rows to um, predate virus yellow spreading aphids any suggestions for that do you want to answer that one quickly Mark and then I've got a final one for um, Brian and Rob sorry Teresa I was looking for it in the chat can you just repeat that that question um, sugar beet, um, virus yellow, aphids, um, companion cropping, good species. Good species. Um, uh, off the top of my head, I don't want to answer that in too much detail. Um, it is an area of research. Because I think that's like for yeah. sugar beet, that's been a, a massive impact this year and we'll, we'll come back. Brilliant. Just um, don't grow sugar beet. No. <laughs> Well, some of us are trying hard, aren't we, to, to do it. Um, so just a final kind of question, Brian, there was a question right at the beginning about have you had kind of long established margins, um, you know, like Rob has, and you know, you have across the farm on, on many ways. Um, it's a question about actually kind of cutting hedges and, you know, then is the compaction on that having an adverse effect? Do you want to just have a, a final word on, on management of these? Um, yeah, well, as I said, we, we haven't really gone down the sort of linear routes, uh, linear options in the past, but now obviously we're going to start learning this sort of stuff. But we've um, 
done a, some work with hedge cutting. Um, obviously, it's got to be on the right time of year. It's going to be very dependent on what's flowering and what soil conditions are. But we're also looking at how we sort of maintain our hedges differently, so not just always flailing them. So we've done a sort of um, what we call citizen science experiment where we've actually coppiced um, laid and did all different types of management to a hedgerow alongside one of these um, flowering strips to see what um, impact that has and do we need to go back on a regular basis because we found where we've been coppicing the hedgerow to the floor and then re-putting the brash into that same place um, that we've actually seen that, that we haven't actually needed to go back and maintain it on a regular basis as, as we used to do with the flail. So there's lots of stuff going on um, but I would say um, the whole thing with this IPM, it's also getting the food webs all going back to school and what feeds on what, that ground beetles, if you have lots of them, are then going to be feeding and being predated on by other farmland birds, other insects going on. So it's not just um, this, this very sort of blinkered approach. We're looking at the farming landscape has to start buzzing again because that's what biodiversity is calling for so we need to sort of get more of this done and if we can do it that's going to benefit our crops and benefit us financially in in the long run um, then it's going to be a win-win for for the industry because there's going to be more insects more biodiversity it's going to be better on our pockets and it's going to look fantastic with all these flowering strips and margins and everything else going on so it's a real big plus point big pr for the industry if we can get more of it done Brilliant. Thank you, Brian. Um, I think we've got through most of the questions. There are a couple of others that we haven't quite got to, um, but I'll send those to, to Mark and Hannah and Brian and Rob, and we'll make sure those answered and we'll, we'll let you know um, the answers to those. Um, I, I just wonder, just to kind of finish off um, this morning, Christian, if you're able to launch the uh, other poll, we're just uh, interested, you know, having heard what you've heard this morning, what are these actions would you look to do on your own farm or um, on your client? businesses if you're agronomist and advisors you know are there things kind of going back to Mark's actions for you to do will you go out pit bull trapping um, putting some slug bait traps in reviewing your landscape creating habitat or all of the above hopefully we've inspired you so if you want to just click on the poll we'll, we'll see what we've inspired you to do today um, hopefully a few of those so we're getting there it's kind of you're going to be pleased with this result um, Mark, uh, there's a few people got a bit of homework to do over the winter. Brilliant. I think, Christian, would you like to display the results? So, pitfall trapping, about half of you are going to do that. A um, few more being inspired to go out and look at slugs. Um, early morning is definitely the time to do those um, over the winter. Brian, you've just had um, the guys out from now and there's lots out at the moment. Reviewing your landscape and creating habitat. And I think we can't ask for more than that. 95% of you going out to, to look at creating more habitat. Um, so, well done to all of you. I think that's a good result. Thank you, Christian. So just to round up this morning, um, if we just, there's a couple of things just to bring to your attention um, and kind of follows up on a few of the last questions on there. Um, so the resources that we've got available, um, so there's the East and the West Harvest Reports, so they're all available at the website at the bottom. They have in them the specific species mix that we've used on both of the sites and um, what the, the advantages of those are. If you have any more specific questions to those, please do let us know because um, we can we can come back to you, can't we, Mark, on that? And there's, there's a lot of information out there. Equally, there is the video um, with Brian and Kate um, introducing the flowering strips of the East and um, Rob sharing his thoughts at the West uh, for you to look at. Um, the next slide, Christian, is then kind of talking about the handouts. Um, as I've mentioned a few times, the handouts, and you've got a couple of minutes just to click on them um, on the bar, um, they're, they're, they're really worth kind of downloading. Um, so there's the West Report, there's the Encyclopedia, which you can order for free um, from us. If you haven't got one yet, drop me an email, I'll get one sent to you. Um, there's the one about um, which crop you're growing and what you're looking for in terms of um, strategies for controlling these pests. And there's also, if I've got this pest, what kind of beneficials um, should I be looking at? And then there's the one about how to go and put your own pitfall traps in. So they're all there. We'll make sure those are available um, alongside this recording as well. Equally, um, the ASSIST research, there's a lot of information on their website and GWCT have got some great information on their website as well. So um, there's lots of information out there. Um, but as ever, just ask us if you can't find um, what you're looking for. 
Next slide, Christian, please. Um, so we're coming to the end of Strategic Farm Week now. Um, as we said before, please do kind of watch the videos. Um, we've got the last session um, tomorrow morning, which I'll talk about in a minute with Emily. We've got a podcast that Brian's hosted um, that's going to be out tomorrow, looking forward to Harvest 2021. Um, and there's the report and the resources. And as I say, it's all on that website. We try to make it as easy as possible for you. You've got one place to go to and we'll make sure it's all on there. So next slide, Christian. Um, so tomorrow morning, um, we're actually going to run a Teams event. So you've got an opportunity to talk to us um, with our researchers that are out on farm um, next year. So SIUC up in Scotland, ADAS over in the West and NIAB over in the East. Um, you can register for that via the website and that's going to be looking at what's happening next year. Equally, there's a lot of other activities going on over the winter. Our webinar series um, with our monitor farmers on Monday evenings, Agronomy Week, um, which is looking at um, the technical agronomy results coming out um, we'd have shared in our agronomist conference and our agronomy events um, which is week after next and then other kind of events and things going on um, on an online format so they're all on our events page on our website so I think the last thing to say is if you've been inspired by things you've heard and you've seen this week and you're down in the south or up in the north in Yorkshire Lancashire Dorset, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, Hampshire, Oxfordshire, um, we'd love you to be involved and um, to be a part and we're actually going to be recruiting a new strategic farm um, to cover one of these areas. So if you're interested in that, um, please do drop Natalie an email, have a look on our website and we'd love to hear from you. I think, you know, as Brian said today, there's a lot of kind of change in policy, you know, Rob's enthusiasm and Hannah and Mark, you know, as Hannah said, we, we want to hear from you what evidence you need us to, to be looking at to, to face these kind of challenges going forward. So um, do get involved with that. So I think that's all um, from me to say thank you um, for joining us. There is a survey um, that will launch as you leave here. Please do fill that in um, and put in any comments. It is really useful to hear um, what you thought, what you'd like us to cover next year and going forwards. The session has been recorded, um, so we'll, we'll share that with you afterwards. And if there's anything that we haven't covered or you want to know, please do ask us. Um, there's my contact details there and everybody's um, Twitter handles there. You know, please do get in touch as we we'll take forward. So a final massive thank you um, to Mark and Hannah for your yeah, really interesting presentations um, and the research and sharing with us those results and we'll certainly keep an eye on, on what's going on on those and as ever to Brian and Rob thank you for hosting us, thank you for your teams, to you and the teams on the farm, um, it's yeah thanks to you that we're here on talking about it and got these things to share. I think in this world we've still got a lot to learn, there's a whole world of insects out there for us to discover um, and we will you know keep a strong eye on this going forward so thank you to all our speakers and we'll see you again soon good luck reviewing that landscape send us your plans send us your findings thank you